Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, CIRA International. And this is um, uh, going to be one of our lecture series. Uh, this time, we are going to take a different approach. Um, in lieu of apologetics, we are going to talk about issues related to uh, politics and political Islam in particular. Uh, the topic of Sharia law, by the way, and ISIS are two of the hottest topics, at least uh, for as far as I can remember, since I began to do my teachings and lectures. Many people are interested to know what is Sharia, why is there a push uh, from sometimes Islamic communities, and uh, so many other factors related to that. Sometimes maybe they read things in the news about Sharia actions or punishments that were imposed on Muslims or non-Muslims in other parts of the world. Maybe sometimes they feel like there is some concern that if Sharia is uh, implemented here, where Muslims live, maybe that will be something that will um, uh, trump, if you wish, uh, our constitution or our law of the land. So in order to put people at ease, uh, my hope is that I'm going to explain Sharia law uh, and help you realize that it's not just an easy thing for any group, for that matter, to decide that their law should actually trump the law of the land, and especially when it comes to this idea that Sharia law is needed in Islamic communities. With that said, let's start uh, our journey here. Obviously, this is a two-part series. The first lecture today is going to focus on Sharia. The second lecture is going to focus on ISIS and how both ISIS and Sharia tie together. Of course, I intentionally called this the Islamic State Phenomena. And the reason why I'm calling it this way is that this idea that ISIS is just a ragtag group that came out of nowhere is absolutely as false as anything you can imagine, simply because ISIS is trying to present the faithful image of the purest teachings of Islam found in the documents of Islam, the primary sources, the Quran, the Hadith, and coupled with the Sharia law interpretation. From their view, from their perspective, they want to live the 7th century Islam, the theocracy of the 7th century Islam. This is why ISIS and Sharia fit together and at the same time, it's a phenomena because you can change the name from ISIS to Al-Qaeda or to any other groups you want, and you'll find out at the end of the day that all of them almost have the exact same motive, but yet they may take a different approach to reach the ultimate goal. So, back again to Sharia. What is Sharia law? And is it an Islamic law or not an Islamic law? In other words, is it a civic law? Is it a law that just certain group of people throughout the history of Islam came up with? It has no backing whatsoever in Islamic primary sources, the religious sources. And is it practiced everywhere in the Muslim world? In other words, if you go to any Islamic country, do you expect Sharia law to be the law of the land? And what is it basically in relationship to... Uh, the Islamic State, Caliphate. What's the relationship between the Caliphate that we've been hearing about lately, which at least may be a surprise or something new to the Western world, but it was never actually a foreign term to an Islamic, uh, uh, basically, uh, the Islamic region or a Muslim person, because Muslims study about the history of Islam, and the Caliphate is part of the fabric of the history of Islam. And also, is Sharia a monolithic thing? In other words, if all Islamic countries today decided that Sharia law will become the law of the land, do you expect the same interpretation, the same basically traditions to be implemented and applied everywhere you go, whether punishment against certain crimes or transactions or other aspects of life, social, economical, political, or religious. And the million-dollar question, is Sharia law compatible, for instance, with the United States Constitution? These are the guiding questions that I will be uh, 
We've been through throughout this lecture today when I'm talking about the Islamic Sharia law. Now, what is the role of Sharia, basically? Many Muslim Americans will counter this idea that Sharia is essential. In, in fact, they would want basically the rest of the American society and the Western world to believe that without Sharia, actually, life is not possible in the Islamic community. And also I'd like to counter that any harsh punishments or unconstitutional aspects associated with Islamic law have either been exaggerated, abrogated, or superseded by the American law. Muslims around the world have varying views about what Sharia entails and its role in personal and public life. Here is what I mean by that. Every Islamic region, based on their own tradition, Sunni or Shia or any other branch, they will have their own way of interpreting Sharia law and applying Sharia law and living under Sharia law. Furthermore, not all Islamic countries practice Sharia law purely. Sometimes there is a mixture between Sharia law and civic law made by man. Sometimes it's purely Sharia law, and only there is two examples that I can think of in the world that have this pure application of Sharia law. Example like Iran, and that's a Shia tradition. Saudi Arabia, and that's a Sunni tradition. And at the same time, I'm going to show you now this chart. Even if Muslims wanted Sharia law, look at the chart and see how many branches of Islam, even under the main names and branches like Shia or Sunni or Ahmadiyya or others. So which form of Sharia law Muslims are calling for? It's not just easy to say, I want Sharia law. You have to really be specific now. What Sharia tradition all Muslims in a Western country will be willing to live under? Keep in mind, let's assume for the sake of this argument that the Sunni Sharia law is the one that the Muslim community agreed on the majority of them wanted basically. Are the Shia Muslims willing in that particular Western country to live under that form of Sharia law? The answer would be no. Are Ahmadiyya Muslims willing to live under the Sharia law for the Shia or the Sharia law for the Sunnis? Of course not. So the issue is more complicated than it sounds. And also, the idea that Sharia law is necessary for the Muslim community everywhere they go is also false because Muslims, by virtue of practicing their faith freely in the Western world, they're already living most of the aspects of Sharia law in their daily routine and daily practices. The only difference is things that we will talk about pretty soon here during the lecture. Moreover, the reintroduction of Sharia law is a long-standing goal for Islamist movement. Why? Because this is the way that the Islamists can gain domination over the Islamic population. Let's take ISIS for an example. ISIS basically was birthed in an Islamic country. They took portions of Iraq, that's an Islamic country, and portion of Syria, that's another Islamic country. Yet at the same time, they did not treat all the Muslims in these two parts of the world fairly. Most refugees, who have left because of ISIS are Muslims, simply because they were not treated fairly under ISIS's form of Sharia law, which is basically the seventh century form of Sharia, which is kind of baffling to me. Sometimes I hear Muslims complaining about why ISIS is doing what they're doing, yet if you read the history of Islam and how Islam started it and how the original Sharia law was implemented, in the formative years of Islam, you will see that ISIS is following those basically historic events and historic decisions almost to the letter, using various examples from the Islamic uh, history and Islamic own resources. Any attempt, of course, to impose Sharia law in the Muslim world in particular have always been accompanied by controversies, violence, wars, and many devastating outcomes. And of course, we go back to ISIS, and we know exactly the outcome resulting from ISIS taking control 
in certain parts of Iraq and Syria. And the outcome of that, of course, is the many refugees that have left that region, not only minorities like Yazidis or like Christians, but also the majorities of the population who are nominal or cultural Muslims as well. So what is Sharia? Sharia really is an Arabic word that literally means a path to be followed or the path for water. In other words, the path for life, because without water, especially when you're living in a desert, you can die from dehydration. Sharia, of course, means that it is the way for life, for living. It encompasses both a personal moral code and also it encompasses aspects of religious law. In other words, there is no separation between civic, social, or political, or religious. In Sharia law, all of these systems are under one banner called the Islamic Sharia law. What are the sources for Sharia? The Quran, the Sunnah, which is two parts. That's the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet of Islam, and his biography, meaning the way he lived, called the Sirah, the example of how he practiced Islam, how he lived Islam, how he ruled, basically, uh, the Islamic State. Because the model that the Prophet of Islam set is the prototype for the Islamic State everywhere. And then you have the third source, and that's the Islamic scholars, simply because you need judges and jurisprudence who can interpret these sources, which is the Hadith, the Sirah, and the Quran. And at the same time, you need judges to come up with rules or rulings, I should say, in this case, uh, using a judicial term. Uh, if the Quran and the Hadith and the Sirah were silent on something, they're going to need to come up with a way to figure out what would be the judgment or the righteous judgment according to Islamic law based on these sources, even when the sources are silent on this particular action. Sharia then equals Islam. As a Muslim, technically you are submitting to the teaching of Allah in the Quran, the teaching of the Prophet in the Hadith, and the interpretation and the application of that by the judges or the Islamic judges. Therefore, every Muslim who is practicing Islam purely, he is already living under Sharia law or some aspects of Sharia law. Islamic law technically is a theocracy. It's living under the law of God. And this applies not only to the Muslim people, but to everyone who's living under that law. And here I want to point out a major difference. Many of our Muslim friends will point out to the Old Testament and to the theocracy that is found in the Old Testament, uh, basically for the people of God, Israel, who lived under the law of Yahweh. But one thing I'll remind people about, that law, the Ten Commandments and others like that that are found in the Old Testament, only applied to the people of God within the boundaries of the promised land, even if it was a small area of that land. And anyone who wanted to convert and come and live there would be also bound to respect that law. But never that in that law, the Jewish people were commanded to go and invade others and expand Judaism and force others who even do not want to embrace Judaism to live under their law. That's the significant difference, basically. There is no separation, of course, when it comes to Islamic law between religion and state. And therefore, if you are a non-Muslim living in an area where Sharia law is applied, you have no freedom to practice your religion or your political views simply because Sharia law denies you that right. This is a graph to further explain these sources that I just mentioned. The Word of God, the Quran at the top, that's the source from which comes all the other sources. It is the Quran that commanded Muslims to obey the teachings of the Prophet and to use him as the model. This means the Sunnah, is birthed out of the Quran, even though it's almost equal to it. The Sunnah includes the lifestyle of the Prophet as the model. It also includes his sayings known as the Hadith. Then comes the judges who basically rule in Sharia law according to the teachings found in these two tiers, the Quran and the Sunnah.
even if the judges could not find a single direct example that represents what the judgment should be based on a specific crime that the Quran never talked about or the Sunnah never talked about, they still must base their judgment in accordance with the teachings that are found in the Quran and in the Sunnah. In other words, the Quran and the Sunnah remain the primary source for that no matter what the issue they're dealing with. Sharia in the Quran, if we look at the Quran, the word Sharia basically was mentioned in association with the God of Islam, for instance, and that's, uh, for example, in chapter 45, verse 18. It was also mentioned in association with the Prophet of Islam in chapter 5, verse 48, and also it was mentioned in association with the judges or the jurisprudence, and that's in chapter 45, verse 13. What does Sharia cover? There are various ways, technically, to uh, categorize the things that are covered under Sharia law. One way to look at it is this. All Islamic laws and rituals, uh, all Islamic rituals, uh, I should say, are covered under Sharia law. That includes the way to pray, how to pray, how to fast, how to give zakah or charity, how to perform pilgrimage, the creed of Islam and conversion to Islam and so on and so forth. It also includes, as a second category, human behavior, the virtues, the uh, do's and don'ts, and things of that nature. Also, crimes and punishments. And this also applies not only to Muslims only, but also to non-Muslims. Simply, uh, punishments for adultery, punishment for what is uh, called the highway robbery or mischief in the land, and so on and so forth. There is also another category called business and contracts. Not only it's regular business transaction, but also marriage falls under this category because marriage under Sharia law is simply a business transaction. And then you have external relations, and that's how to deal with people of other faith, how to treat non-Muslims, how to treat Christians, how to treat Jews, how to treat uh, Buddhists, or Hindus. Uh, so if you live in, if you someone who followed these religions and you live under Sharia law, there are rules that apply to you according to the interpretation of that particular tradition and that particular country. Here's another way to look at it. Sharia law governs personal affairs. It governs the community or corporal affairs. It governs legal issues. It governs civic issues and it also governs religious affairs and spiritual matters. Now, what is the objective, uh, uh, the objective uh, of Sharia law? First and foremost, it is religious supremacy. Here's what I mean. Sharia law intends always to make the Islamic community and the Muslim people to be always superior above any other laws, no matter where they live. And hence, the push for Sharia law everywhere, Muslim communities continue to go and grow at the same time. All of this comes, of course, from the pages of the Quran. Here is one example of that. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 85, said it very clearly. And whoever desires a religion other than Islam, it shall not be accepted from him. And in the hereafter, he shall be one of the losers. So, in other words, Islam is the only religion that is acceptable by the God of Islam. This translates into things like this. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 110, talking about the Muslim community, calling them, you are the best of peoples, evolved for mankind. In other words, the Muslim people are the best of mankind. What does that make the rest of mankind? A step below. Non-Muslims are called in the Quran in chapter 98, verse 6, the most vile of created beings. And I, it always baffles me when my Muslim friends tell me that Islam actually promotes human rights and equality among different races and different religious people. Right here, the Quran denies that. The Quran is making it clear, not only non-Muslims are a step below, but they're even called vile of created beings. And then in chapter 48, Verse 29, the Quran actually explains to the Muslim people and exhort, exhorts them, basically, 
to behave in certain ways among themselves within their own Islamic community versus how they should treat others outside of the community. And here's what it says. Be merciful to one another. That's within the Islamic community as Muslim brothers and sisters, but ruthless to the unbelievers. It cannot get any clearer than this. When was Sharia developed? It was developed technically between the 8th century and the 10th century. In other words, Sharia law wasn't in place during the formative years of Islam when it birthed, at least. It continued to develop during the early formative years or during the first three centuries, but it finally became fixed by the end of the 10th century. And from there on, many things took place by way of codifying it and many other traditions began to develop. During this time, between the 8th and the 10th century, two primary dynasties, Islamic dynasties or caliphate, contributed to all of what we have today. You have the Umayyad dynasty that lasted for 90 years between 691, uh, actually 661 to be specific, but for 30 years from 661 until 691, there was some civil war taking place that resulted in a birth and a schism between Sunnis and Shia and went all the way until 750. And Damascus was the center for that place. It was predominantly ruled by Sunnis. And then you have the Abbasid dynasty that lasted for a very long time, also known sometimes as the Golden Age, from 750 until 1254 when the Mongols came and sacked most of the, uh, array, uh, the uh, caliphate of the Abbasids, specifically the one in Baghdad. And then uh, after that came other dynasties. But the Ottoman Empire also is another phase that resulted also in codifying the Sharia law and adding more of those laws that were borrowed from European laws as well because of the expansion of the Ottoman Empire into Europe. But nevertheless, this is how Sharia law started it. There was a need in those days to basically begin to interpret different uh, traditions and multiple schools began to evolve. And I'll show you now which schools are they. During these two dynasties between the 8th and the 10th century, a number of schools of interpretation of the law of Islam evolved. Actually, there is four that lasted today, but there were much more before that. But only these four that apply to the Sunni schools have survived. You have the Hanafi school. Almost 31% of Muslims in the world follow them. We're talking about 1.6 billion Muslims in the world today, so about 31% of them. It's a moderate school. You have the Maliki school, which comprises about one quarter of that, about 25% of the Muslim population. It's considered to be conservative school. Then you have the Shafi'i school, which is about 16% of the Muslim population. It's to tend to be traditional school. But then you get to the Hanbali school, which is very limited in its uh, utilization. And it's the one that is considered to be the ultra conservative. About 4% of the Muslim world followed it. You'll find this primarily in Saudi Arabia, for instance. Then you have the Shia schools. The dominant school is the Jafari school that is found in Iran, and it, about 23% of the Muslim population uh, basic follow it, but almost most, if not uh, all, of the Shia basically schools uh, or Shia Muslims follow that school. The remaining small percentage follow other minority schools, uh, such as the Zaidi and the Ismaili, and also there is the Ahmadiyya Muslim branch as well. Here's a map just to show you this concentration of Sharia law. As you can see, uh, Iran and Saudi, technically speaking, are the only two that could be classified as pure Sharia law abiding countries. Outside of that, there is a mixture between Sharia law and civic law. Here is how the process worked, and here is how ISIS and the likes of ISIS tend to push back to restart this process. At the very beginning of Islam, it used to be just a tribal system. You have the head of a tribe, and the head of a tribe is the judge, and the members of that tribe will tend to go and abide by that rule. The Prophet of Islam served that way. The Islamic community was small at that time. He was almost the head of this spiritual tribe. 
And then Islam began to expand, covering Arabia and parts of Egypt and parts of Syria and Iraq. And there was a need now for local, uh, basically, jurisdictions. Uh, you have the Baghdad, you know, you have one in Damascus, one in Kufa, one in Basra, one in Medina, one in Mecca, and so on and so forth. Then the Islam and the Caliphate expanded, covering all of North Africa, almost most of Spain, and the majority of Asia Minor, of course. And now you have regional schools of interpretation. And finally, after World War I, there was division in the Islamic world and ended up divided into states. And each state now has their own way of interpreting Sharia and a mixture between pure Sharia law and civic law. Who is qualified to interpret Sharia? Learned Muslim scholars who are called fuqaha or jurist, and the science of interpretation called fiqh or jurisprudence. How is it applied? There are different approaches to apply in Sharia law. There is something called ijma or the majority consensus. In other words, if the majority of Islamic scholars at a specific time decided that the punishment for a certain crime should be this way, usually the rest of the region abides by the majority decision. But this could change based on the time. Then you have qiyas or analogy from the Quran and Sunnah. Let's say there is no punishment for dealing with drugs, but you can use analogy to compare the effect of drug dealing and the idea of corrupting the community to something like highway robbery and terrorizing the community. The punishment for highway robbery could be death penalty. Therefore, some nations can use the death penalty also against a drug dealer. Then you have something called ishtihad. That's an individual, a very astute scholar, who decides to basically come up with his own or her own, uh, his own judgment. Uh, I apologize, there is no her in Islamic law. Uh, that was just a slip of the tongue. But nevertheless, it's only a male. And usually, he is the one that will say, okay, I'm going to judge this particular crime or this particular uh, uh, basically ritual has to be practiced or done this way. Usually, it's used whenever there is something silent or maybe there is a need to reinterpret certain things based on the times. There is a push for this right now by many moderate Muslims to try to reinterpret certain aspects of Sharia law based on what ISIS have caused in terms of the havoc and the chaos that is happening in the Middle East these days. However, this particular practice was seized by, uh, in the 10th century and it hasn't been basically accepted anymore. Even if there are individual clerks these days can come up with their own ishtihad judgment or rules, uh, I doubt that they, any of the other uh, basically sanctioned entities, religious entities, will pay attention to it. And then you have, according to the Shia school of practice, something called the aql or the reasoning, and it's exclusive usually to Shia schools. Contemporary views of Sharia today, you have basically secularist that believe that the law of the state should be based on secular principles, not on Islamic legal doctrines. In other words, let's reinterpret everything according to secular needs based on the 21st century. No need to use the Quran or the Hadith or the Sunnah or anything of that matter. This is a minority view. I doubt that it will even gain any tractions. Traditionalists who believe the law of the state should be according to the specific tradition, a Maliki, a Hanbali, uh, a, uh, uh, basically uh, an Ahmadiyya maybe uh, type, uh, maybe a Jafari uh, type, and so on and so forth. Then you have the modern reformers who will say, we still use Sharia law, but there is a need to basically reinterpret certain aspects and modernize certain laws. For instance, when it comes to uh, rights of women and freedom of religion and things of that aspect. They are anti-theocracy. Also, uh, also, they are basically under attack usually from the conservative schools. And then you have the ultra-conservative reformers like ISIS, who wants to bring everybody back to the 7th century 
model known as the Salaf or the Salafi schools. Sharia court proceedings. Here, where I want to show you now if Sharia law is compatible to the U.S. Constitution. In Sharia courts, traditionally, there are no lawyers. Plaintiffs and defendants represent themselves, although in business transactions, you can hire basically a civic lawyer uh, or an administrative lawyer, but that doesn't mean that it is similar proceedings like you see, for instance, in the Western Hemisphere. Trials are conducted solely by a judge. There are no jury, and the judge can really issue a judgment on the spot. Some trials can take just a matter of less than an hour, basically. And there is no pre-trial discovery process, no cross-examination of witnesses, and unlike the common law, judges' verdicts do not basically set binding precedents. So a judge in this town could make a judgment that the judge in the next town may not really go by or use it as precedents. That goes anti what is known, for instance, in the West as stare decisis. What is that? Basically, it means that the decision must stand. Whatever was decided will be used as precedent. If a judge or a Supreme Court judge, for instance, in the U.S. decide to go against that tradition, that's called a landmark decision because usually it's a decision that did not go with the tradition that go all the way back to the British law, basically. Unlike civil law, Sharia does not utilize formally codified statutes. Codes were formally introduced, though, only in the 19th century during the decline of the Ottoman Empire. And here is also further clarification about stare decisis. It's the Latin word, like I said, to, uh, is, uh, stands for to stand by that which is decided. Whatever was done, now every judge has to follow that precedence. And it's the principle that the precedent decision are to be followed by the court. That's very important, by the way. But also, it's the same thing that Sharia law does not practice is what the Muslims in the West are hoping for. Once a lower court, basically, comes up with a decision in favor of Sharia law, and this decision is upheld by an upper court, that becomes a law now, and therefore, Sharia becomes the law of that particular town or that particular state or region or could be the land as well. It's kind of, uh, kind of an irony, really, that uh, Sharia law doesn't practice what it's aiming for. And other things about Sharia court proceedings. The rules of evidence emphasizes basically the use of oral testimonies and confessions. Oftentimes, there is abuse of that where the authority will force confessions out of people by abuse or threats or coercion. Legally, basically, it's endorsed, uh, uh, you know, sometimes legally endorsed written evidence might be accepted, like maybe an affidavit or something of that nature. Eyewitness accounts carry more weight. Many times you hear stories of innocent people that were punished because of false claims and false witnesses. Forensic evidence like fingerprints, ballistics, blood samples, DNA normally are not used, except lately some crimes, and because of modern technology, they're leaning towards that. Another circumstantial evidence is likewise rejected, especially in Hadood cases in favor usually of eyewitness more so than other things as well. However, like I said, lately there is a use and utilization of those kind of means. Sometimes these practices, of course, uh, can really cause harm more than help, especially when it comes to family courts and the way women are treated under the law. I'll give you a couple of examples for how women sometimes uh, could be treated and favorably or how women also can take advantage of Sharia law, sometimes for their favor, sometimes against them. For instance, when it comes to divorce, under Sharia law, the man have the ultimate authority unilaterally to divorce his wife. If he does and follow the condition under Sharia, the wife will be divorced automatically. And technically speaking, he has the right to keep the children unless he negotiates with his wife. But equally so, if the man basically was absent, uh, non-basically cooperative, doesn't take care of his wife, she has evidence to prove that, 
the judge can actually offer her something called khula, separation, forceful separation. Sadly, even when that happens, usually it takes years before the judge is willing even to grant such a request. But then there is another one called fasqh, and that's because under Sharia law, a Muslim woman can only marry a Muslim man. Under this law, if the man becomes non-Muslim, leaves Islam, convert to Christianity or something of that sort, then the court will step in whether the wife likes it or not and they force a divorce between them simply because he's no longer a Muslim and therefore he cannot have a relationship with a Muslim woman. That's how Sharia law works. Then when it comes to crimes and punishment, you have something called hudud. These are fixed laws, basically revealed in the Quran, ordained by the God of Islam, yet sometimes the extent of the judgment is still unclear, so judges have to still step in and determine that. Example like, for instance, adultery is the punishment for women who commit adultery to be sent into exile into their homes for the rest of their life. Is it lashing or is it stoning? And it applies usually to most serious crimes, and they are not negotiable once the court decide that there is a capital punishment for this particular crime, such as highway robbery, for instance, or lashing for public drunkenness. Now, when it comes to uh, other crimes, there is something called qisas. Qisas, or retaliation, uh, is set by the Quran and Sunnah, but it allows restitution. In other words, you can pay blood money, for instance, if someone murdered somebody, if the family of the deceased willing to take monetary, basically, restitution, they can waive the judgment. Notice, murder falls under this, doesn't fall under the hudud or the capital punishment, basically. And then you have something called tazir, and that's where it's the least serious. It's based only on the human judgment of the judge, and he bases it on analogy and his discretion. It's not binding. And the judge can really come up with sometimes judgment that are really awkward and weird. Like, you know, you have to go and paint somebody's house. Or you're going to have to clean this street. Or you're going to have to spend uh, six years in jail where there is no judgment pre uh, uh, prior to this. Or standard or uh, something that he was basing the judgment on. Here is another map to show you, actually, the uh, concentration of different, basically, schools of Sharia in terms of how things are inter interpreted. What about the compatibility uh, with the Western law in terms of freedom of speech? Criticism of the Prophet or rulers in some areas of the Islamic world who practice parts or whole Sharia law are considered a blasphemy and may result in death penalty. What about the LGBT community? Well, in most countries, it's punishable by death. What about women? They have limited marriage and divorce rights, restricted inheritance rights, no leadership rights, personal freedom rights are lacking. A friend of mine, his name is Dr. Bill Warner, and he has a ministry, and his ministry basically called the Center for Is uh, Islamic Politics. And he really spent the time to do some statistics based on the Quran, based on uh, the teaching related to women. And here is what he came up with. And I like his analysis basically because it simplifies, uh, simplifies the matters. Here is what he discovered. In 71% of the Quran, when it comes to teaching about women, it's always presenting women in a low status. And only in 5.3% of the time, woman has a higher status. And the other time, it's almost equal status with men. In other words, the majority of the teaching uh, presents itself that women will be treated as a lower status, lower than men. What about in the teaching of the prophet? Almost 90% of the ta time, the women have a lower status in terms of teaching towards them or about them. And a fraction of 1% that they should be treated with a higher status and the rest is just equal status. Compatibility with Western law in terms of freedom of religion. There is a distinction between Muslims, people of the book, and pagans. There is also something called dimitude status. All non-Muslims who live under Sharia law have limited rights. 
And sometimes, according to the Quran, chapter 9, verse 29, that's where ISIS comes in handy. They were forcing, basically, Christians who are willing to live under their law to pay taxation known as jizya, or head tax for protection. And here is also, again, Dr. Warner's, basically, analyses when it came to the teaching of the Islamic sources, the Quran, the biography, and the hadith, towards infidels in general, you can see that according to the Quran, 64% is negative against infidels. The biography and the model of the Prophet was 81% negative, and the saying of the Prophet, almost 37% negative. The totality of this so-called trinity is 60% negative towards infidel. I hope you find this information very helpful. We encourage you, of course, to download it, to share it with others, and if you would like for me uh, to be also a teacher to your group or to your uh, church or other places, you can always contact me through sirainternational.com. Thank you for watching and have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like this video and don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you will be notified of new videos.